taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Nanny Doss The Giggling Granny Originally born as Nancy Hazel, in 1905, Nanny Doss' childhood was harsh. Her parents were poor farmers in a tiny town called Blue Mountain in the Hill Country, in northeast Alabama. Her father, James Hazel, was an angry and aggressive man who ruled his family with a rod of iron. The Hazer children were forced to work in the fields from an early age, though this would be reasonably common in rural areas at the time, but it also meant they lacked an education, as they missed school to do so. Also, if any of the children were quarrelsome or acted out, they would suffer the pain of a beating. By the age of five, Nancy, aka Nanny, was clearing and plowing fields, and also cutting wood. None of the children were allowed to have friends and weren't given the time to do so. It was a tough life in rural Alabama and many families survived by having all hands on deck. When she was still young, Nanny received a serious head injury while visiting a relative. She had been on a train which had to make a sudden stop, which jolted her forward and banged her head against the iron frame of the seat in front of her. She experienced blackouts and pain for months afterwards and had headaches for the rest of her life as a result. Some suggest that this might have been the cause of what happened later, while others counterclaim that she was just bad from the start. Nanny's only relief from work and punishment as a child, were the romantic story magazines her mother bought. She loved to look through them during any spare time she got. Sadly as she grew into a young lady, Nanny had little opportunity for romance in her own life. Her father prohibited his daughters from attending social events such as barn dances in the area. They were also not allowed to wear makeup, silk stockings, or tied dresses. It did not stop Nanny from having a good time however, as she would often sneak away to enjoy the company of boys in haylofts and barns. In his old-fashioned ways, James Hazel had always said that he would find husbands for his girls and he eventually found one for Nanny. Charlie Braggs was a co-worker of hers at the Linen Thread Company, where she had worked from the age of 16. He was tall, good-looking, and he seemed to dote on Nanny like a husband should. Her father liked the fact that Charlie was devoted to his mother and not as footloose as most of the young men in the area. Four months after they met for the first time, Nanny and Charlie were married. The marriage would turn out to be difficult however, with Charlie's mother not being unlike her father, a domineering and demanding woman. The couple got on with married life the best they could and Nanny had four daughters in four years. Soon things began to take their toll however, the pressures of family life and in particular, of sharing a home with her mother-in-law drove Nanny to alcohol. She also developed a smoking habit that would have been extreme in a man. Nanny then began to find her amusement elsewhere, consorting with men in the gin palaces of Blue Mountain. As for her husband Charlie, he was so drunk himself that he didn't even notice that she was not at home. At other times, he was out chasing women in another part of town. In the year of 1927, the two middle daughters of their family mysteriously died. They had sat down to breakfast, perfectly well, and by noon they were dead. The doctor described their deaths as accidental, but Charlie wasn't so sure. He fled the marital home, taking his eldest daughter, Melvina, with him, but leaving the youngest, Florini, behind. Charlie later described how afraid he was of his wife. Her mood swings were extreme and he refused to eat or drink anything she had prepared when she was in a bad mood. Nanny's husband was gone for a long time, almost a year, before finally turning up again in the summer of 1928, but to her surprise, he was in the amorous company of a divorcee and her child. Nanny got the message and left, with Charlie remaining behind, the only one of her husbands to survive marriage to her. Nanny then moved back in with her parents and found work at a cotton mill in Aniston, not far from Blue Mountain. 
she still enjoyed the romantic magazines and decided to try her luck in the Lonely Hearts column she liked so much. She wrote to a number of men who had advertised, but one stood out for her beyond the others. Frank Harrelson was a handsome, 23 year old factory worker, who lived in Jacksonville. After making contact, Frank fell for Nanny and they were married in 1929. Unfortunately, Frank was an alcoholic who had also served a jail term for assault. He was not quite what he said he was and the regular visits from the Jacksonville police to let her know that her husband was in jail for drunkenness again, confirmed this fact. He was also abusive, just like her father, but Nanny persevered with the marriage for 16 years. Nanny's daughter, Melvina, had already had one child, Robert and became pregnant again in 1945. Nanny the doting grandmother, was present for the birth and nursed the baby when it finally arrived. However, her daughter Melvina later told, how as she lay semi-conscious from the anesthetic in bed, she saw Nanny with a newborn baby cradled in her arms. She then thought she saw her mother produce a long and very sharp hat pin and drive it into the child's head. The doctors could not discover what the baby girl had died of six months later. Robert, Melvina's son, later died while in Nanny's care. The doctors diagnosed asphyxia from unknown causes. Poor Melvina had lost both of her children. Nanny mourned and seemed distraught at the graveside, but was notably less so, when she picked up a check for $500 from an insurance policy she had taken out on her grandson. In August of 1945, the tragedies striking the family weren't over, it was now the turn of her husband Frank. On the 15th of September, he went out celebrating the end of World War II, welcoming home some friends who had been fighting overseas. He then went home drunk and demanded sex from Nanny. She became furious and determined to take action. The next day, she found his corn whiskey jar hidden in the garden poured out some of its contents, filled it with rat poison and then replaced it where she had found it. That same evening, Frank Harrelson had a drink and was suddenly consumed with excruciating stomach pains, dying immediately from the poison, he was aged just 38. Afterwards, Nanny wrenched out the jar. Her life for a short while after this incident is vague. She seems to have traveled extensively and some suggest that she was married to a man named Hendricks. Whether he survived the marriage is unknown. In Lexington in 1947, within two days of meeting him, she married a man called Arlie Lanning that she had met through a Lonely Hearts column. A true whirlwind romance if ever there was one. Unfortunately for Nanny, he was yet another philanderer and drinker. But when it got too much, Nanny would take to her heels and leave for months on end. Whenever she returned home, he would promise to stop the womanizing and the drinking, but his promises never lasted long. When she was at the wedded home however, she presented to the world a picture of a devoted wife. Her absences were explained as visits to her sister who had cancer, or to look after Arlie's 85-year-old mother. There were other issues in the household though and the neighbors gossiped, mainly about Arlie who could often be seen in Lexington's red light district. Soon Arlie died suddenly of heart failure, or at least, that is what the doctor concluded. No autopsy was carried out due to the fact that he was a heavy drinker, and that it was thought that he had been suffering from the virulent flu bug that was rampant at the time. Afterwards Nanny said, he just sat down one morning to drink a cup of coffee and eat a bowl of prunes I specially prepared for him. Curiously, or maybe more cunning, the house that Nanny and Arlie had shared, burned to the ground not long after his death. It had been left to his sister in his will, but the Nanny got the insurance money instead. She had also managed to get her beloved television out of the house before the fire, ostensibly to take it to be mended. Nanny then moved in with Arlie's mother, but left sharply after Mrs. Alanning died in her sleep. She then went to her sister's house but Dovey's condition seemed to deteriorate from the moment that Nanny arrived. 
she died on the 30th of June in her sleep. Soon Nan E joined the Diamond Circle Club, a Lonely Hearts organization that sent out a monthly newsletter for $15 a year. In 1952, she decided to find another husband. She was 47 years old now and beginning to lose her looks. Therefore, it seemed sensible to look for a more mature sort of man. Richard Morton of Emporia, Kansas, was just such a man. He had been a salesman but was in retirement and now looking for a woman to share it with, Diamond Circle put him in touch with Nanny. She then moved to Emporia where they were married in October of 1952, another whirling dervish of the romance. Morton was a handsome older man, who was half Native American and he treated her well, at first, buying her presents and jewelry. Eventually however, she realized that it was all being done on credit. He owed everyone. Not only that, he was also dallying with other women in the town. Marrying him she realized, had been a big mistake, but for Nanny that wouldn't be a problem. His demise was delayed however, by a visit from her mother following the death of her father. In a world where time is money, Nanny decided she couldn't wait any longer. Her mother then tragically died, suffering chronic stomach pains not long after arriving at her house. Nanny's husband Morton, followed a short while later. Nanny's fifth husband was 59-year-old State Highway Inspector, Samuel Doss, a God-fearing individual who unlike her previous husbands, did not drink, smoke, or chase women. He was thrifty and loathed frivolity. Unfortunately, he was also deadly boring. The couple married in June of 1953 but Nanny soon became fed up. Sex was always pre-scheduled in the romance novels and stories she adored were banned. Even things such as the electric fan were regimented and only switched on when temperatures were extreme, also the lights had to be religiously switched off when leaving a room. She was fed up but delighted to discover that Samuel Doss had made a couple of fundamental mistakes. Firstly, he had given her equal access to his bank account. Secondly, he had taken out two insurance policies of which she was the beneficiary. If only he had known about the prunes. One evening, following a delicious prune cake, Samuel Doss experienced severe stomach pains. He was taken to hospital where he stayed for 23 days to recover. They said he had suffered a severe infection to the digestive tract. Upon him being released from hospital, Nanny served her husband up a cup of coffee and a pork roast. Unfortunately for him, the coffee was laced with arsenic. By midnight he was dead. This time however, the doctor was perturbed by the sudden illness and death. He ordered an autopsy to be carried out. The official results found that arsenic had been in Samuel Doss' system in horse-killing quantities. Nanny was arrested and police began to look back at her history, learning that four of her husbands had also died suspiciously. She then confessed to the murders of her husbands, her mother-in-law, her sister, her own mother, and her grandson, apparently giggling while she did so. For her crimes, she was sentenced to life imprisonment on May 17, 1955. Nanny Doss died in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary of Leukemia in 1965.